It promises to be the weirdest inauguration in history. In expectation of violence, highway signs leading to the nation's capital read, avoid travel to Washington, D.C. Another fear, the coronavirus, has cloistered hundreds of thousands of other would-be inaugural attendees. In their absence, the National Mall is covered with American flags, a symbol of unity that masks the disunity reflected in the presence of 25,000 National Guard troops. They ring the mall in federal buildings. They shut down roads and bridges. They check IDs in an eerily quiet city. Their presence has laid the groundwork for wacky conspiracy theories by people who should know better. The Guard is... 90 some odd percent, I believe, male. Uh, only about 20 percent of white males voted for Biden. You got to figure that in the Guard, which is predominantly more conservative, and I see that on my social media and we know it, they're probably not more than 25 percent of the people that are there protecting us who voted for Biden. The other 75 percent are in the class that would be uh, the, the large class of folks who might want to. Uh, I do something. Congressman Cohen claims that 75 percent of the guard, quote, are in the large class of folks who might want to do something. I'm curious, is there is there anything you've seen to substantiate just how broad this in, insider threat may be, if it, if it exists? Absolutely not, Jim. Yet the FBI has screened all 25,000 guardsmen, presumably including those here with expertise in biological, chemical and nuclear warfare. It's no wonder, then, that smoke from a nearby homeless encampment Monday prompted a brief evacuation of the Capitol. Strangely missing in much of the hysterical coverage is the anti-Trump violence that marked the last inauguration. That day was a window on the often chaotic four years of the Trump administration that would follow. A window on the behavior of Democratic leaders who let their cities burn in the interest of social justice over protecting peace and private property. A window on a president who, for all his successes, was handicapped by apparent vanity, forcing his press secretary on day one to toe the line about record inaugural crowds despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary. Photographs of the inaugural proceedings were intentionally framed in a way, in one particular tweet, to minimize the enormous support that had gathered on the National Mall. A window into the world of governance by executive order, a manifestation of Congress's inability to compromise. On day one, Trump undid the executive orders of Obama. On day one, President Biden will undo the executive orders of Trump, leading to head-snapping reversals of policy. The shining light on the hill has become, in the eyes of the world press, among allies and enemies alike, an unpredictable, unsteady giant. At least, there will be the international language of music again at the White House. The mostly progressive entertainment elite have come out of hiding to perform for the new president. From Garth Brooks, who says this is not political, to Lady Gaga, they're all on board the Biden train. And like my friend Joe Biden says, it's on us. At least for the time being. I've got a hundred million reasons to walk away. President Trump, who never seemed to be all that much of a music fan, he never hosted a White House concert during his four years in office, will not be here to see all that. Moving vans have already arrived at Mar-a-Lago, and he is scheduled to leave the White House and Washington at 8 a.m on Inauguration Day. Doug McKelway for the Washington Examiner.